So then, <laughs> I'm guilty, guilty as charged. charged. Guilty of what? Stealing your heart. Hello everyone, it's Sam, aka Ocean Unknown, and welcome back to my channel. I haven't made a video about a Dang and Rampa fam project in so long, so it's finally time, or you could say, despair time. Today's video is all about the wonderful fan project, Danganronpa Despair Time. Part 1 of Chapter 2 of this web series has ended, and the last episode was a roller coaster of emotions, so today we will be talking about the catalyst for all of the absurd events of the second trial. The reveal of the true nature of the ultimate inspirational speaker, David Chiem. As your TV show host, I'm here to bring you a message from the show's director. Murder is A-OK, -okay, kids! Before I fully discuss the main topic of this video, I wanted to give some background knowledge on this fan project. Danganronpa Despair Time is a non-profit fan-made spin-off of Danganronpa, consisting of YouTube webisodes that emulate the visual novel style of the Danganronpa games. Like Danganronpa, Despair Time features a cast of 16 students given the title of Ultimate for the various talents who are forced into a killing game and the only way to escape is to commit a murder and win a class trial. Created by an anonymous creator along with the assistant of Jenna Barris on Twitter and Mighty Hydrator on Tumblr, Dingarapa to Spare Time follows Teriko Tawaki, the ultimate lucky student, as she wakes up in an unfamiliar place. As she, alongside a newfound companion, Xander Matthews, the ultimate rebel, explore what should be Hope's Peak Academy, a school for ultimate students, they are introduced to a gaggle of other ultimate students. Suddenly, a little cat robot with a TV for a head named Mono TV reveals that not only are the 16 students participating in a television show called Dingarapa to spare time, but they will also be forced to kill each other. As everyone is panicked about the killing game, the mutual friendship between Teriko and Xander is cut short as Xander stabs Teriko while they're alone in the computer lab. However, Teriko survives and hours later finds Xander's dead body in the computer lab. In the trial, it is revealed that Min Jung, the ultimate student, killed Xander initially to defend Teriko, but then tried to frame Teriko in an attempt to escape the killing game leading to the deaths of the other 14 students. This trial alone with almost being murdered by her closest ally makes Teriko quite distrustful of her peers as the motive for chapter 2 begins. Mono TV passes out the students' worst secrets to them, which leads to the murder of Are Nageshi, the ultimate bowler. As the investigation and trial of Are's murder go underway, the primary suspect ends up being David Chem. As more and more gets revealed about David, this leads us into the topic of today's video. So then... I am guilty as charged. So, how did we get here? David Chiam is a renowned inspirational speaker who has motivated many with his speeches, mostly focusing on positivity and uplifting others. As Xander and Teriko find the 14 other students, David is the first to walk up to them and talk to them, simply by stating that more people have arrived. During the introductions in the prologue, David is the fifth character to be introduced besides Teriko and Xander. As soon as David introduces himself, Xander is immediately taken aback, screaming and startling both Teriko and David. David asks if ever everything's alright, and Xander reveals that he is a massive fan of David's speeches. Teriko, not knowing who David is, asks if he's famous, in which Xander says, Famous? Famous? Mr. Worldwide. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Mr. David is known worldwide for his incredibly popular and charismatic speeches. He's extremely renowned because of how he encourages and uplifts those who listen to him speak. Supposedly, he gets tons of letters every day from fans telling him just how much he's turned their lives around. David chimes in saying, Haha. You flatter me. And then confirms that it is his goal to inspire people and help people find their own motivation. Xander continues fanboying over David, saying he's a huge role model for him, and David seems a little flustered, not knowing how to respond to Xander's enthusiastic praise. Xander asks for his autograph, running off to grab something for him to sign, leaving David and Teriko in the classroom together. David says, oh, Am I done with these dumb introductions already? This really sucks. Damn, why'd I even come to this ridiculous school? I hate talking to people anyway. I wish you were in bed. While David is saying all of this, his eyes change from the bright, inspiring yellow to a dull gray. Teriko is noticeably uncomfortable as David is startled, saying, Uh, you're still- you're still here? I- I mean, I thought you went with Xander. His eyes turn gray again as he says, Uh, <laughs> 
Uh, I see. Please, forget what you heard. Xander comes back with something for David to sign as David's demeanor switches as quick as a light switch, saying, Of course, anything for a fan, with bright flowers surrounding him. Terrico calls this out immediately, asking David, So did you not want to come to Hope Speak? Which confuses Xander since he was gone. David replies, Ah, don't mind her. Terrico and I were just having a little chat while you were gone. Please keep it a secret between us two, all right? As he puts his fingers to his lips and walks off. Xander, very confused, asks Terrico what that was all about. With Terrico asking, is this guy really your role model? He doesn't seem as positive as he makes himself out to be. Her suspicions anger Xander as he claims Terrico has fallen victim to popular rumors that David is a phony. Xander speaks ill of anyone who questions David's career, saying they only want to destroy his image and tear down good people. This theme of potential rumors about David continues as in his bio, it says, as one would expect, David is a constantly optimistic personality who encourages those around him to keep on moving. His true personality may be more pessimistic and lazy than he lets on, according to some unreliable sources. After it is revealed to the students that they are in a killing game and television show, Levi Fontana, the ultimate personal stylist, almost dies after trying to destroy Mono TV. Even after a very close taste of death, Levi still has hope that no one would resort to killing each other to escape. David backs up Levi, saying, Mr. Levi's right. We're all going to work together. We're not going to fight each other like you want us to. Do you really think we'll lose hope because you say we will? Give us more credit. We are ultimates after all. Mono TV leaves, but pops up again after everyone has left to say, Even if you can find a way to destroy me without getting killed, it's not going to do anything. There's someone controlling me, so I'm not the source of this. You said you wanted to trust each other? Try this one on for size. The real mastermind is one of you. Take that information however you will. Also, comment down below if you want me to make a mastermind theory video about Dingarumpa to spare time like I did for Project Eden's Garden. It's definitely a video I would love to make. As all of the students contemplate on what to do after learning that they're all on a killing game reality show, David says, let us avoid doing anything rash for now, specifically in regards to Levi attacking Mono TV. The students decide to investigate the school to uncover any secrets or possible escape methods they can find and decide to split into teams. Terrico decides to go with Xander again, but Xander says it's best to branch off. However, he actually already paired up with David, whereas Terrico is left to pair up with Charles Cuevas, the ultimate chemist who has already left the room because one, he's more of a loner, and two, he has hemophobia and left the room after Levi started bleeding from Mono TV's punishment. As Charles and Terrico continue exploring, they discover that they were given different weapons that seemingly correlate with their talents. The group reconvenes, and as the group discusses the world outside and the threat of murder among them, David tries to keep hope alive by saying no one will kill anyone and they can all escape together. The next couple of days, the group tries to find new ways to escape, but also tried to adjust to their new lives, such as having an arm wrestling contest to see who who can open a broken elevator, Terrico baking cookies and cakes with Min, Eden Tabisa, the ultimate clockmaker, and Rose LaCroix, the ultimate art forger. Mono TV then reveals that the students will receive motives to commit murder, which gives everyone anxiety. The next time we see David is the day before the motives are given out after Ace Markey, the ultimate jockey, bullies Terrico and the main target of his rudeness, Nico Hakobian, the ultimate pet therapist. He wants to talk with Xander and expresses his awkwardness towards Xander calling him his idol since they're now acquaintances. He says, I do appreciate that you like my work, but I'm not as special as you think. All I do is give motivational speeches, and Terrico and Xander are quick to reassure him that his skills are impactful. David explains what his speeches are like to Terrico, saying he discusses how to find success and overcome roadblocks to happiness like apathy and lack of motivation. Xander once again is quick to praise David's speaking skills as David says, Again with this high praise. Really, it's quite embarrassing. I truly do wish to help my listeners, but I'll admit it's quite difficult to have many who look up to me as some sort of model of how to live. It's a lot of pressure for me to act as some archetypal perfect person. I have a lot of people looking up to me, but I also have a lot of people to let down. Xander apologizes for his constant praises and idolization of him, in which David says, don't apologize, Xander. I don't mind it as much if it's from you. Indeed, I've only known you in person for a few days, but I know that there's something special about you. You wanted to make Nico feel comfortable, even though you wouldn't necessarily get something out of it. In some way, I suppose. I suppose that you're my role model. Touching that you of all people would think so highly of me. 
I suppose that make us both motivated not to let each other down. Xander is taken aback by David's words and says, You don't have to worry about letting me down because I'll always like you for who you are. You've already done plenty for me, so don't push yourself further. Enough with these idols or role models, okay? Let's just be friends. David is startled by Xander's proposition, but thanks him and accepts his friendship offer. As Eden gives out the cookies and cake her, Min, Rose, and Terrico made, Xander and David continue being all buddy-buddy as Terrico thinks about how happy this moment is. Everyone is enjoying themselves, and it truly has seemed to distract everyone from the motive. Well... Honey, you've got a big storm coming. That night, Terrico meets Xander in the computer lab to discuss his plan on finding the mastermind. Xander then reveals that he lied to her and has no plan, and that while he still wants to stop the mastermind, he's more preoccupied with trying to figure out the secrets behind Terrico. He says... But I suppose it's too late for me to find out, now is it? Before apologizing to her and stabbing her deep in her stomach. As he pulls out his knife, he says, Ah, uh, shit, I'm sorry. I, I'm the worst, aren't I? I? I hate murderers. I hate the smell of blood. And I hate this feeling. I would have never, I would have never wanted to hurt you. Then why did I do this? I don't even know. Why? Just why did you ask me to kill Terika? He doesn't reveal who he is referring to and then says to Terrico, I'm sorry, I really am, but I have to do this. I need to trust in myself that this was worth it. Xander leaves as Terrico sees a vision of a girl she once knew with red hair and yellow eyes like Xander who apparently tried to help Terrico in the past. Terrico wakes up in the infirmary and tries to get back to the computer lab, but everyone is exchanging weird glances at her especially David. As Terrico enters the computer lab, she finds the dead body of Xander with a bloody gash on his neck. Terrico and Min investigate the crime where Terrico finds a message reading, Kill Terrico Tawaki on the back of the forged out of order sign on the light switch. After they leave the computer lab, David is still giving Terrico the most bombastic side eye. One might say it's a criminally offensive side eye. When asked for his alibi, he is still giving Terrico the cold shoulder before he says, Pardon my rudeness, but I'm not really in the mood to talk to others right now. Could you please leave me alone? Xander is dead. His eyes go a little grayer as Terrico tries to comfort him by saying Xander wouldn't like to see him like this. His eyes fully go gray as he says, Can you stop that? I'm sorry. Forgive my outburst. He gives Terrico his alibi that he was in the laundry room after dinner where he saw Min get cleaning supplies, and Nico was there for a short while but left after seeing David. He asked to be left alone, and Terrico asked for the other's alibis. Before Terrico can hear everyone's alibis, Mono TV interrupts to say the investigation time has ended and it's time for the class trial. The 15 remaining students go down to the trial grounds as the trial begins. David's first remark in the trial is to say he'll avenge Xander and bring his killer to justice, and as the students start piecing together the evidence of the night before, David is awfully suspicious of Terrico. He says it's hard to believe that Xander tried to kill Terrico, and everyone starts to agree with him. He says, why don't we vote already? I don't see much point in dragging on this class trial when we already agree on who the killer is, as Terrico becomes the prime suspect for Xander's murder. Everyone starts to gang up on Terrico, saying they already decided she's the killer before she was even conscious again, except for Eden, who gives Terrico a little bit of validation. As everyone is just about ready to vote Terrico as the killer, she says, Y'all all die? That's why you're voting for me? You're doing this because you don't want to die? Seriously? <laughs> all right, fine. Go ahead and vote for me. If you want to end your life that badly, go ahead. Everyone is shocked at Terrica's feelings as she replies, I suppose that it's my fault for not anticipating this. Xander pretended to be my friend and then betrayed me to try and end my life. You all are the same. Terrico calls herself a fool for trusting any of them, further saying, Why did I ever think that I could be friends with you all here? Why did I think everything could be normal? I shouldn't have ever put my trust in anyone at all. She promises to prove her innocence and prove them all wrong as David says, I must say, your apparent lapse in sanity is concerning at best. It doesn't do much to help your case. It would benefit you to work on your charisma. 
Regardless, how exactly do you plan to prove to us that you aren't the killer? Even after Teriko brings up solid evidence to defend her case, David is still refusing to believe that Xander tried to kill her. He tries to deter the conversation by saying the blood stains from where Teriko was stabbed were Xander's, and Teriko gives the most dead stare I have ever seen. She says, I am not a person capable of moving Xander's 170 pound body and scrubbing away blood stains while I have a stab wound in my abdomen. Unless you're saying I did all that first and then stabbed myself afterwards for fun? Even if I did that, which one of us would have cleaned up my blood? Can you stop being so incredulous for a minute and listen to what I have to say first? Which he replies, <laughs> there's no need to be so vitriolic. We're all doing our best to solve this murder. And yet, even as more holes are poked into the theory that Terrico killed Xander, David still has his doubts. David opposes Terrico in the nonstop debate, where Wit Young, the ultimate matchmaker, says, Believe it or not, Starboy, you've only known Xander for a few days, so you can't guarantee that what he did was out of the ordinary. After it is fully accepted that Terrico didn't kill Xander, David motivates Nico to share their alibi, but David quickly shuts that down. As Nico tries to thrust blame onto others without saying why they were pacing around thinking about the motive. Later on, after Rose and Terrico bring up the possibility that Xander wasn't killed by being stabbed in the neck and that the killer stabbed him afterwards, David interjects saying he doesn't see how an injury as severe as a neck stab couldn't have killed him. Terrico disproves his point by saying the bloodstains on his body looked too perfectly in place, meaning he was stabbed in that exact position his body was found, which means he was already dead or at least unconscious. The trial continues as the students discuss how Xander was directed by someone to kill Terrico, but David says there's no point in going down that road unless it's crucial to uncovering who killed Xander. As Min starts to look even more suspicious, David starts to get on Terrico's side and starts accusing Min. Min confesses to killing Xander, and the students vote her as the killer, except for two anonymous students who vote for Terrico. David yells at Min, saying, How dare you! You killed Xander, and you were perfectly willing to kill everyone else here to escape? Soon after, Min is executed and everyone is horrified watching her be tortured and then eaten alive by dogs. David says, I've seen enough. There's no point in keeping my hopes up anymore. We are all certainly going to die here as he walks away. Terrico laughs hysterically as she mocks the students' despairing reactions. She calls out their hypocrisy saying they knew exactly what was going to happen to Min. She says, she made a choice to kill and she paid her price. The same happened to Xander. I saved all your goddamn lives even though none of you deserve that! If I get close to anyone, I'm going to be betrayed. I can't do that to myself. I don't want to be hurt again. So I'm never going to trust anyone. Never again. After this trial, fans of Danganronpa Despair Time seem very divided on Teriko. Either people love her for how she breaks the mold of a Danganronpa or Fangam protagonist and feels like a truly realistic character in a death game, or they despise her for her negative attitude and refusal to trust anyone. Personally, I really like her character because she has just been betrayed twice, so she has every right to feel this disdain for trusting others. And that distress also makes her a much more realistic character for the scenario she's in, and also makes her unique. It's also clear that Terrico's distrust and sometimes rude attitude is from her fear of being hurt. And she does have a lot of feelings to unpack. Now you may be wondering why I'm bringing all of this up about Terrico in a video about David. Well, that will be revealed shortly. Terrico's slight outburst after Min's execution leads us to chapter two, all that glitters. Mono TV reveals the next motive is that the students will be given each other's deepest, darkest secrets, and if a murder doesn't happen in four days, their secrets will be revealed to all of the students and to the whole world. As everyone bands together to try to end the killing game before the four days are up, Terrico interrupts to declare that she has no reason to escape and that she'd rather just live there forever. She tells everyone that their optimism is useless, saying, You will all die down here without ever seeing the outside world again. Not saying this out of ill will, it's simply how the story works. You all have the misfortune of being characters in a story where I'm the protagonist. Because of that, you're all doomed. In the next episode, Terrico says to Wit that she doesn't see herself as a good person and is indifferent to the fact that she's not. Days pass and a majority of the students are arguing, which aggravates David. He shouts, that's enough, and states that he has an important announcement. He says, my secret is that I have a family history of depression. 
Everyone is shocked by David's sudden compassion as he continues saying, the reason you're all fighting is because you're stressed from this killing game, right? More specifically, stressed over this motive. The fear of having some secret of yours revealed to the entire public has put everyone in a tense mood. That's why we should share our secrets. If everything is out in the open, then there won't be any reason to commit murder. Imagine it as a confession of sorts. You'd be surprised how much weight comes off your shoulders once you admit what your secret is. Of course, it's not as easy as I say it is, so I won't pressure you to. I can't force anyone to reveal their own secret ahead of time, but I will fully support those who take the leap of faith and do. Hiding secrets from others will only breed distrust. If we have nothing to hide, then we have nothing to fear. This might be a niche reference, but what else is there on this channel? But David sounds like he's been listening to the Adams Family musical a little too much, specifically Morticia songs. This, I'm shocked. What kind of marriage is it where you keep secrets? Secrets are the enemies of passion. David continues saying, think about it carefully, and I hope you all will follow my footsteps and confess your secrets as well. It's the best way to fight against this motive. As the students contemplate David's idea, he asks, what's stopping you then? If you know that it's for a good cause, is it fear? embarrassment shame no matter how bad your secret is i will accept you i can't promise that everyone else will do but i'll do my best to change their minds however wit says that he can't just reveal his secret to everyone because he and everyone else don't know what secret is on another student's card david asks wit for reassurance if he did know what his real secret was that he would tell everyone which he says he would jay rosales the ultimate effects artist reveals that she has charles's secret and david encourages her to share with scent of Charles. Charles's secret that his older brother passed away but he doesn't remember him leaves Charles very distraught, which David says, again, you may have your reservations about my proposal to share secrets. That's why I don't want to force anyone. Come to your own conclusions as to what the right thing to do is. However, I do think that you all should, at the very least, talk privately to the person whose secret you received and tell them what their secret is. Leave it up to them whether or not they want that information public. Everyone has a right to know what their secret is and who carries it. He promises to let everyone know about his idea, which leads into chapter 2, episode 5, which starts with David meeting R.A. in the playground. R.A. says she wanted to talk to him about his secret, but are interrupted by Teriko and Eden. Eden tries to invite R.A. to do some arts and crafts with her and Teriko since earlier in the show, R.A. got mad at Eden for not inviting her to bake with her men, Teriko and Rose, but R.A. blows up on Eden and says Eden's cheerful, optimistic attitude is why people keep dying. R.A blames Min's death on Eden and accuses her of playing the victim, and Eden runs out of the playground sobbing. David interjects to tell R.A. she went too far and asks why she hurt Eden like that. R.A. tells him that she can't stand nice people unless they're suffering. David is taken aback by R.A.'s statement, but R.A. as fast as a rocket switches back to being cheerful. She asks Teriko to confess her secret, but Teriko calls her out on her bullying and threatens her. Once again, David interjects saying, both of you, please stop with the hostilities. Ra, if you're going to share your secret, then do it. Ra confesses to ruining her older sister's lives and getting them unrightfully sent to a reform school, which shocks David as Ra lists everything she did to harm her older sister's reputations. She has no remorse for what she did, however, because her sisters made her life a living hell. She continues on saying the only retribution to what her sisters did was to make them suffer. However, R.A. says the trauma she faced because of her sisters taught her that the only way to deal with adversity from others is to crush people until you reach the top. R.A. fully believes that kindness is weakness, which explains why she hates Eden so much. David is still in a state of shock from Ari's mantras of the dog-eat-dog -dog world and her writing off kindness as a whole, as Ari continues by saying, I'm not a cruel person, I'm just trying to survive. She claims that by making Eden cry, she's helping her. Ari says, the killing game only proves my worldview right. Only strong people who take advantage of others can survive. That's how the world works. And if Eden doesn't realize that soon and quit trying to be the nice one, she's going to suffer for it. She goes on saying it's unfair that Eden gets to be kind because in Ari's mindset, kindness can't exist. As Ari starts to break down, David says, Ari, I'm sorry. He joins her on the floor and says, even if you say you didn't care about your secret, it clearly brought up bad memories. I can't say what you did to your sisters was right, but I can definitely say that what they did to you was wrong. No one deserves to be treated that cruelly. 
You least of all. You didn't deserve that. He asks more about her home life and says, Your family might have been cruel to you, but you don't have to see them anymore. Your life and situation have changed and you're an adult now. You can spend the rest of your life around people who are much kinder and much more mature. You'll soon see that the real world isn't as harsh as you were led to believe. You don't have to act cruelly to survive anymore. Azari says that everyone will still see her as a horrible person. David reassures her. You can change. People can always change. Things will get better. I promise. All right? Ra reaches out and hugs David, which kind of straddles him as she says, Thank you. You're nice too. Says she needs a moment alone and leaves the playground, but David runs after her to presumably continue their conversation. Moving on to episode six, David tries to stop Ace from picking on Nico because Ace got Nico's secret. David quickly snatches Nico's secret from Ace and tries to get Nico to confess their secret as he thinks that's the reason Ace was so hostile towards them. Nico allows David to read their secret, which reveals that Nico was mocked for their identity by their friends and family. But David is not 100% sure of what that fully means in this context. David, who, and Teriko comfort Nico as Nico comes out as non-binary to them, and David says that his plan of everyone confessing their secrets is going well. However, Nico says they weren't ready to come out. I just wanted to quickly say that what David did in that scene is absolutely despicable and disgusting, and... I did not know about that scene when I first went to write about this video, so I had a very, like, visceral reaction to it. I wanted to not, <laughs> like, show all my complete anger in this video and just say, like, respect people, don't out people, and just kind of sharing my feelings, being like, yeah, I went from, like, wanting to write the video um, because I thought David's character was interesting to absolutely hating him, and, like, my anger has subsided, but it's still like that scene just leaves a very bad taste in my mouth. But just a reminder to all of you, be respectful, don't out people. What he did is never okay. Anyways, David tries to get Teriko and Hu to confess their secrets, but they both decline. David continuously holds the fact that their secrets will be revealed soon over them as a reason for them to expose themselves to him, and when he doesn't get what he wants, he resorts to asking them to reveal a non-personal, silly secret about themselves. What frustrates me the most about David, other than everything I just ranted about, is that he sugarcoats his words with a concept of consent by saying things like, I'm not going to force you. Like, no, you are peer pressure pressuring everyone to reveal their secrets and nothing good has come out of it. You outed Nico, you made R.A. have a breakdown, Charles Curley had a very bad reaction to a secret being outed by Jay, and Jay has been made very uncomfortable by Arturo. This will all make sense when I talk about David's reveal, but this all makes sense to the type of person he truly is. To get Hu to reveal an unserious secret about herself, David says he has really bad bedhead in the morning. That's called foreshadowing. And who reveals that as a child, she went by Julia as her English name. The next day, David heads to the kitchen to clear his head and Wit suggests he goes to the relaxation room, which he does. The following morning, everyone goes to the screening room for the reveal of everyone's secrets. But before Mono TV can reveal them, David interrupts to say that someone is missing. Ari. As Ari's body is discovered in the playground, David says, of course, of course this would happen. During the investigation, Jay asks Mono TV about the motive since it has to be in one way or another connected to Ari's death, but David quickly interjects saying, hang on, Mono TV said that it would release the motive only if a murder didn't occur in the allotted time span, but a murder has indeed occurred. So then, Mono TV is not obligated to share those secrets. David also deduces that the time span that Ari could have been killed is noon the day before to 8 a.m. that day. Later that day, Mono TV reveals the secrets in the screening room, where David goes to see the secrets and comments on how interesting some of them are. Teriko is quick to call out David's hypocrisy with the secret and asks what his true intentions are, in which his rebuttal is that it's in his best interest to know the secrets to help solve the trial. She also calls him out for the fact that his secret of having a familial history of depression is not one of the secrets. David is quick to say he didn't know what secret of his would be used, so he assumed it was regarding his family history of depression. When Terrico
Marco asks what his real secret is, he covers his eyes and says, Seriously, will you shut up already? Please. As the trial begins, Terrico decides the best way to solve the case is for everyone to reveal whose motives they received. People start revealing the secrets they received, but David asks if he can go last. The secret he received is, how could I even select what secret could be your motive? Just about everything you've done in your life is worth killing for. The killing game is your fault, which he says is Xander's secret. During the trial, David is quick to deter Veronica from guessing people's secrets with no explanation due to the amount of fighting the secrets have caused before R.A. died. Fighting that you caused, David! And then... Of course, David as fast as lightning contradicts his last point by singling out who in Eden for not revealing whose secret they received, which he says his reasoning for singling them out is because they're the type to help everyone out. Moving on, after Eden tells everyone about how Ara made a promise to be her friend and be someone she could rely on to explain a suspicious note that the killer impersonating Eden used to lure Ara to where she was killed, David, uh kind of starts to lose it. His eyes go gray once again as he says, what kind of person would fall for such an obvious trap? You'd have to be short-sighted, naive, foolish, senseless, downright idiotic. Unless, of course, you were R.A. His eyes go back to yellow and starry-eyed as he continued. That girl wanted desperately to prove herself as a friend to Eden, yet she completely lacked any experience with what friends were actually like. Of course, it never occurred to her that handing out suspicious notes was not something that normal people did. His eyes go gray again. What could she know about friendship after all? Someone like her, who had not once experienced kindness in her entire life up until now? Even if she had her misgivings about something so suspicious, she must have pushed it aside due to her unwavering faith in her blossoming friendship. A friend that she didn't understand in the slightest. It's it's so... <laughs> it's just so foolish for someone to take advantage of Ari like that. He covers his eyes. It's almost unforgivable. All she wanted was to change. What a reprehensible person this killer is. I look forward to seeing their painful execution. As the trial continues and everyone is sharing their alibis, Karako recalls that Wit suggested that David go to the relaxation room, which is right next to the playground where Ari was murdered, the night Ari was killed. Everyone starts questioning David's innocence as he was the closest to the crime scene and he just acts sort of aloof. The only other person on the second floor was Ace and David admits that he never saw Ace once while on the second floor in the relaxation room. Ace, as usual, feels very attacked by David's claim, but the conversation switches to how David's secret of having a family history of depression is not on the projection screen with the other secrets. David is unwilling to reveal what his secret actually is and everyone is quick to call out his hypocrisy. He says, please don't accuse me of being suspicious without solid evidence, in which Ace interjects to say, <laughs> you want solid evidence? All right, you asked. Everyone open your fucking ears and listen to me. I know what David's secret is. It's, it's time! This brings us to the most recent episode of Danganronpa to Spare Time, Chapter 2, Episode 11. Ace reveals that he overheard Ra and David the night before talking in the relaxation room. While working out in the gym, Ace heard Ra say in the relaxation room, Why did you lie about your secret? Ace continues to eavesdrop as Ra asks David for confirmation of his true secret. You exist to manipulate others. Everyone else exists to be taken advantage of. David is flustered as he assumes Ra received his secret, but the thing is, she didn't. Ra took a peek at the person next to her, which just so happened to be Wit, who had the manipulation secret with David's name right at the top. As Ra says she's asking him all this because of the fact that he lied about his secret and encouraged everyone to reveal their secrets, David's eyes go dark gray yet again. She expresses how nothing good has come out of David's encouragement for everyone to confess and how worst of all, he told her that she could change. Back to the trial, David is absolutely rattled by Ace's claims. As everyone else is starting to question David's true intentions, he tries to explain why he wanted everyone to reveal their secrets so the motive would lose its power. However, David still won't reveal his actual secret. Terrico asks him to, but he quickly replies, 
why don't you? Everyone then comes to the conclusion that David's plan to reveal everyone's secrets did way more harm than good, but who is quick to defend David saying he didn't know that's how certain people would react? However, whose point is proven false as David is responsible for a lot of the troubles caused in this chapter. Eden says she wouldn't have talked to Arturo about his secret if David didn't suggest that everyone talk in private with the person whose secret they got, and in turn that decision almost cost Eden her life. And Nico not only got forced out of the closet by David, but David's actions indirectly caused Nico to attempt to murder Ace. Even so, who is continuing to defend David? Terrico chimes in saying that she's always known since the first day that David's entire person personality is fake, saying his optimism, his charisma, everything about him, it's all a facade. He's just pretending to be a good person, and you've completely fallen for it. As Who continues defending him, David falls silent. Wit reveals that he did in fact receive David's secret, which is, you exist to manipulate others, everyone else exists to be taken advantage of. As Who falls into a complete sense of denial, David is still silent, and then he finally speaks up. Uh, Sorry, I got a little distracted, that's all. I was just thinking about the last trial, how Min was accused by everyone, and even when she realized that her case was finished, she kept fighting. She kept arguing and yelling and crying that she was innocent, even when no one believed in her, even when it made her guiltier. At that time, watching Min, I kept thinking. How utterly pathetic she was. She should have realized that she was wasting her energy with that sad performance. The only thing she accomplished was gathering pity. Back then, I thought to myself, if I was ever in the same situation, then I would know when to stop fighting. That way, I can keep my pride. With that in mind, I guess I should stick to my words and give up. Not to mention, I kind of don't want to give the satisfaction of ruining my life to anyone else. So then, I am guilty as charged. I'm a lying, manipulative, scumbaggy piece of shit. Is that what you all wanted to hear? Everyone is taken aback by David's sudden change in appearance and demeanor. His eyes are now completely gray, his hair is all tussled, his bow tie is no longer tied, and he got so angry he unbuttoned his shirt. As everyone is trying to take it in, he continues, Hold on! I'm not finished talking. Didn't your parents teach you any manners? Or are you all too fucking stupid to know how rude it is to interrupt someone's speech? Right. I'm a good-for-nothing liar. But I call those lies motivational speeches and everyone eats it up. People can always change. <laughs> what complete bullshit! No one ever changes. People who were born lazy, useless, and stupid will stay that way until they die. If you were able to improve yourself into a better person, then it only means you were a better person to begin with. And with that, my career is officially in the trash. Not that it matters anyway, since none of us are going to escape this killing game alive. Whew, it feels so good to say all of that. All that stuff I wanted to say but had to keep to myself and act well-mannered instead. You all should try it. I understand now why you're such an unlikable, irredeemable asshole, Ace. It's really cathartic. Well, everyone is shocked by David's true nature. Terrico is not. She says, as I expected. Levi asks David if Ace's testimony is true, in which David says, perhaps or perhaps not. Normally, I would continue to insist that Ace is an unreliable witness and a worthless lying piece of shit as well, but I know how it is with you people. Once you've reached a conclusion, you'll refuse to believe any evidence that contradicts it, so I'm not going to bother. He admits to meeting with Ra in the relaxation room the night when she died, but in regards to what they were talking about, he says, well, I've already forgotten. She's dead now, so who cares? I mean, why memorize the trash in the garbage bin if it's going to be burned anyway? Everyone starts to accuse David of murdering Ra, and Terrico asks if he has anything to prove them wrong, in which he says, yeah, I do. Go fuck yourselves, all of you. 
As who interjects saying that this is not a defense in the slightest, he says, you fucking idiot. People like you who jump to help others in order to assuage their own insecurities are the easiest to manipulate. It's all because you try so hard to be some kind, helpful mother figure that you so readily accepted that there could be an easy solution to this killing game. Just have everyone expose their secrets and nothing bad will happen. Now we can all be friends. What a tempting outcome and for such little effort. And in spite of how easily you'll spill other secrets for the sake of peace, you're still too much of a coward to admit your own. What's wrong, Julia? Go ahead and share your secret. It can't be that bad, can it? Or is it worse than mine? Worse than Nico's? Or could it be that you're actually not as noble and strong as a person as you make yourself out to be? Who gets very reasonably upset, saying, You knew how I felt, and yet you... You... You toyed with my heart! All that time, you acted like you were encouraging us to reveal our secrets to prevent conflict. <laughs> that was all a lie! David replies, Look, in my defense, waiting for four days for people to even start murdering each other was way too boring. I had to speed it up a little. Everyone continues to accuse David of killing R.A., in which he says, How can you all be this thick in the head? It's a wonder that we survived the last trial, although admittedly you did have men's stupidity working in your favor. All I did was foster the right atmosphere for murder to occur, but I'm not the one who killed R.A. That was someone else. Understand? You don't have any actual evidence that connects me to R.A. If we decided who the murderer was based on who was at the crime scene and who's the biggest asshole here, then we should have voted Terrico out last trial. <sighs> Are you all really that stupid? Did your mothers drop you on the head when you were babies? She should have thrown you on the factory defect pile afterwards so that I wouldn't have to deal with your dumb assery today. Tch, listen to me. I'm not the killer. <sighs> I know when to give up. Like I said, I don't want to end up like men, futilely fighting a war that I can't win. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking fine. I... I killed Ari. Does hearing that make you happy? Everyone is either taken aback or furious with David's confession. As he says, Oh no, a bunch of people who I don't give a shit about are mad at me? No, please, anything but your disappointment. I'm so sorry I'll reverse time and unmurder Ari immediately. Seriously? What do you expect me to say in response to that? R.A. pissed me off. I couldn't let her have my secret, that's all. As everyone is ready to vote for David to his demise, Terrico says that the case isn't finished. She wishes to know how David killed R.A. as he says, Oh? You can't resist the urge to toy with your prey a little longer, can you, Terrico? I already confessed. What more do you want? My hand in marriage? Go die alone. Are you really sure you want to know how I killed her? I doubt you'll like it if I told you what I did. <laughs> Fair enough. David says that he assisted R.A. in committing suicide, saying it was pretty easy to convince her that she should die. He insists that Ari had no purpose in anyone's life, calling her a background character and saying she had as much impact on everyone as a temporary weather spell. As everyone is taking in what David said, he continues, Are we done now? I'm starting to run out of ways to be an annoyance. Even with an explanation, Terrico asked David to explain the evidence at the crime scene. He claims to have pushed her into the pond at some point, which is why the fish from the relaxation room were next to her body, but Terrico is believing none of it. So David changes his confession to say that he actively killed her. With all these new things David is throwing into his confessions, Terrico starts to believe that David didn't kill Ari at all. Terrico begins to poke holes in David's story, and when he asks why she's trying to prove he didn't do it, she says she's trying to survive. As Terrico tries to explain how David couldn't have killed Ari, David interjects. As if I believe that shit. David fights Terrico's suspicions that David isn't the killer, in which David tries to say this is all because of Terrico's untrusting nature. Gosh, Terrico Tawaki. I know you hate anyone who isn't you, but dragging everyone down with you by getting us all executed is a low blow. Even by your standards, you're searching for reasons to distrust others. 
Like you always do. In their rebuttal showdown, David claims he overheard Eden and Ra's conversation and lured Ra out with the note, then killed Ra. During the rebuttal showdown, Terrico and David just kind of say things that they have already said, but I need to play this line, David says. Really? Who cares about your stupid fish? Really? Who cares about your stupid fish? David continues on saying, After all, I'm the only one who met with Ra near the place her body was found. And during the time she was killed. You're out of your element. Charles interrupts their debate to say, I suspected David to be lying as well, but when I was trying to think of evidence to prove his innocence, I realized something worse. Damn it. Terrico, we really fucked up. And that is, as of right now, the final episode of Ding and Rampa Despair Time. So then, what is the impact of David's reveal? And what does his true nature help to imply in the past, present, and future of Despair Time? Uh... <laughs> I'm not as cool as you think. To discuss the impact of David revealing himself as a manipulator and a fraud, we need to start with how this reveal impacts our protagonist, Terrico. A major factor in Terrico's character that I will touch on more later is Terrico's lack of trust in the other characters and her need to keep her confirmation bias correct. For those of you who don't know what confirmation bias is, it is the tendency for someone to search for, interpret, favor, and recall information that confirms or supports their already existing beliefs or values. Taking into consideration Terrico's belief that she is cursed by her luck and her lack of trust in anyone due to her traumatic past and Xanar and Min backstabbing her, Terrico has a sense of confirmation bias to seek out evidence that no one can be trusted and that she makes everything in the world worse. This is why she pushes away Eden, the person kindest to her, and wishes to investigate the crime scenes alone so no one will tamper with evidence. The reveal of David's true nature is further confirmation for Terrico to trust no one. The person who sets themselves up as the inspiring leader, the one who will bring an end to the killing game is nothing more than a fraud who has no hope for any of them to survive. David is also the complete opposite of a trusting person. He keeps changing his stories of how he allegedly killed Ra, thus Terrico can't trust a single thing he says. David's malice towards Terrico also feeds into her confirmation bias that she makes things worse for everyone. When you look at how both David and Terrico are written and act in the story, it becomes crystal clear that David is a foil for Terrico. Well, maybe foil is isn't the absolute best word, but David is the personification of why Terrico can't trust people. Terrico and David directly oppose each other in the first non-stop debate, and as revealed in chapter two, David's true mannerisms mirror Terrico's mannerisms in the chapter one trial. The music when Terrico tells everyone that they can vote for her if they want to die that badly is also the same during David's reveal. They are both also apathetic, as Terrico says, I don't care if you all vote incorrectly and die in the first trial, and David says, not that it matters anyway, since none of us are going to escape this killing game alive in chapter two. Despite these similarities in their mannerisms, Terrico and David's ideologies contrast each other and show how David represents why Terrico can't trust others. Terrico's distrust and apathy for others is based on personal experience and pattern recognition, whereas David is apathetic seemingly just for the sake of being manipulative. Also in chapter two, episode three, Terrico reveals to Charles that she has been lying about being being a student at multiple schools to continue getting an education and have a somewhat stable life. Terrico lies for survival, whereas David lies to harm others. David also serves as a red herring and wolf in sheep's clothing to the cast, but most importantly, to the audience. His constant references to hope and appearance are likely intentional to keep the audience in a false sense of security regarding his goodness. The optimism and hope strikes resemblance to Ding and Rampa protagonists like Makoto and Hajime, and a seemingly normal, chipper person personality at the beginning is similar to Makoto Kaede and even fangam protagonists like Yuki Maida of Danganronpa Another. A simple attire like his white button-up dress pants and suspenders is typical for Danganronpa and fangam protagonists like Hajime and Damon Maitsu of Project Eden's Garden. He also has blue hair and is very driven in the trials when it benefits him like Suichi and wears barrettes in his hair like Kaede. And like every Danganronpa and most fangam protagonists, David has an ahoge or a hair antenna. The designer's use of common protagonist appearances and mantras of hope makes it even more impactful that when he tussles his hair, his ahoge falls, almost like he is denouncing his fake persona as the protagonist-like character and declaring his role as an antagonist and Terrico's foil. David's existence as the resident wolf in sheep's clothing of despair time is also hinted at several times in the series and a lot of events in the show were likely intentionally placed at certain times. Or should I say, despair time? 
I already used that joke. To distract the audience from the reality that David is a massive manipulator and liar, first of all is the most obvious of foreshadows, David's eye color changes. When David's act slips throughout the story before his reveal, his eyes go gray instead of his yellow starry-eyed pupils. During his reveal, his eyes go completely gray and only go yellow again when he is being menacing. Along with this, a lot of David's sprites before the reveal show him with one or both of his eyes closed, calling attention even more to his eyes. In addition, David's manipulation tactics are shown throughout the series to subtly expose his true nature. The clearest example of this is that David is a charismatic leader manipulator. An article by Kevin Dom for Inc.com defines a charismatic leader manipulator as someone who uses their charms to entrance people and bend them to their will, which fits David to a T. The most evident aspect of a charismatic manipulator is that their personality outshines their message, and this is clear in how David speaks to everyone and most of all, how Xander perceived David. In Xander's bonus episode titled Visiting Graves, he says, hey, that's sounded cool. I feel like Mr. David right now, saying something super inspirational. Xander truly looked up to David and found comfort in his motivational speeches, and Xander idolized him more as David Sham than anything he ever said in his speeches. Speaking of Xander, in Despair Time, David also serves as a constant reminder to Xander. Both David and Xander's eyes change from yellow to gray, and Xander's eyes go gray when he is sad, but most importantly, when he stabs Terrico. As I mentioned earlier, David's eyes go gray in a similar way to Xander when he is upset and when his true nature is on full display. Now that I've discussed how David's reveal impacts the past events and the story of Dingarampa Despair Time, it is now time to discuss how his reveal might possibly affect how the story will continue with some of my predictions. So then... I am guilty as charged. Since I was just talking about Xander, I think it's appropriate to start with this prediction. I think David was the one who asked Xander to kill Terrico in chapter one. David most likely manipulated Xander since Xander was a massive fan of him and David and Xander's conversation about seeing each other as equals was likely further manipulation on David's part to get Xander to trust him. Further evidence includes that David intentionally deters the conversation in chapter 1 episode 10 of who told Xander to kill Terrico, and David manipulates Veronica in the same episode to distract her from continuing to talk about the note given to Xander that read, kill Terrico to walkie. In the second part of chapter 2, I think David will reveal that he convinced Xander to try to kill Terrico after the chapter 2 killer is revealed. I imagine it going like Terrico saying something snarky like, so your plan didn't go according to plan, huh David? And him yelling back, if everything went according to plan, Xander would have killed you like I told him to. Probably wouldn't surprise the cast as much as his true nature reveal, but it would still affect everyone, especially Terrico. Speaking of chapter one, one of the unanswered questions from chapter one's trial is who are the two people who voted for Terrico as the killer? I think it is a possibility that one of those two was David considering his apathy towards everyone's lives and possibly despite everyone due to his plan of Terrico being killed by Xander not working. Regarding who the other person who voted for Terrico is, the only people I can see voting for Terrico are Min, Terrico herself, or whoever the mastermind is. Next in the predictions is the identities of the six remaining secrets of chapter two. First of all, a lot of these secrets contain very serious topics, so here is a trigger warning for topics regarding these secrets. The six remaining secrets are you are a murderer and you have no remorse, which was given to Ra. You've always treated the competition with ruthlessness, but poisoning them to win was a bit too far, wasn't it? Which was given to Xander. You're constantly blaming yourself for the deaths of your parents and siblings. It doesn't matter that it's not your fault, just that you didn't go with them, which was given to Min. You only took on your talent to distract from your incessant need to harm yourself for fun, which was given to who. You were quite the hopeless child. Dying once wasn't enough, so you attempted suicide three times, which was given to Veronica. And finally, how could I even select what secret to be your motive? Just about everything you've done is worth killing for. The killing game is your fault, which was given to David. Xander, Min, who? Veronica, Levi, and Terrico are the only characters whose secrets have not been revealed up to this point. So here are my theories for whose secrets are which. Starting off with our chapter one victim, Xander, 
I think his secret is you're constantly blaming yourself for the deaths of your parents and siblings. It doesn't matter that it's not your fault, just that you didn't go with them. The main piece of evidence of this prediction is Xander's bonus episode, Visiting Graves, where he and a mysterious unknown student are traveling to Xander's hometown in the States, Cheridan, and Xander brings up a disaster that killed many people and how he wished he was there. He also says, I thought I'd make my parents proud and be someone my siblings could look up to. The way Xander and the unnamed student talk about Xander's past in relation to the disaster in Cheridan alludes to Xander's family dying in the disaster and that Xander feels a lot of survivor's guilt since he was in the UK when it happened and didn't know about it until a month later. This theory of Xander's survivor's guilt is backed up by a secret quote on Despair Times Tumblr that says the definition of survivor's guilt. Feelings of guilt for having survived a catastrophe in which others died. These quotes were used as Easter eggs to help the audience guess the secrets, and this was the quote for Xander. I honestly don't see the secret being anyone else's but Xander's. Moving on to Min, I predict that her secret is, you've always treated the competition with ruthlessness, but poisoning them to win was a bit too far, wasn't it? In Min's bonus episode, A History of Hope's Peak, Min explains how she became the ultimate student. When she was five, Hope's Peak announced the ultimate contest for eminent students, which was a test that would take place 12 years from then, and whomever scored the best would be awarded the title of ultimate student and given the opportunity to attend Hope's Peak. Min's family was low income at the time, but the founder of a tech company told Min's parents that he would sponsor her and pay for her expenses as as long as she won the contest. As Min continues to explain how she truly feels about being the ultimate student, it becomes apparent that Min has imposter syndrome regarding her talent. She believes she only became the ultimate student because she obsessed over winning the contest for 12 years. Min even says she doubts she was the top scorer on the test and says the real point of the test was to see if someone would force themselves to become their idea of an ultimate for the academy's sake and succeed. Her imposter syndrome could also be because of guilt and her dedication to the contest contest in protecting her family's future from the tech CEO could have led her down a more dangerous path of poisoning the competition. Min's secret quote on the Tumblr was, I wanted to save you, which could further imply that she poisoned her competition to save her family. Next is the secret, you only took on your talent to distract from your incessant need to harm yourself for fun which I believe belongs to Veronica. In chapter two, episode seven, Veronica discusses how her love of horror started with her incessant need to be entertained and how the genre aims to elicit negative emotions out of those who consume it. Horror media is how Veronica comforts herself which makes me think that her love of horror is a coping mechanism for her mental health issues and or trauma. Veronica's secret quote on the Despair Time Tumblr also supports my theory, which is, once something is broken, it can never be pieced together in quite the same way again. The same goes for people. This quote could be implying that Veronica sees herself as broken, which is further supported by her talking about her real fear of making a fatal mistake she can't fix in chapter two, episode seven. However, horror turns her fear into excitement, which further shows how important her talent is to her as a person. Continuing on, I predict whose secret is, you were quite the hopeless child, dying once wasn't enough, so you attempted suicide three times. The main piece of evidence is in chapter two, episode nine, when she says, you can't know how someone truly feels just from their external appearance. Even people who are energetic on the outside could have secretly given up all will to live. And while this could easily be just a sentiment, it's likely important that who was the one who said this. Along with that, in chapter two, episode 11, David calls out who for being easy to manipulate because she's the type of person to help others in order to assuage her own insecurities. In the same episode, who also says, if no one relies on me, then I won't be useful anymore, which alludes to her her having a low self-esteem and only viewing herself as useful if she's in a mother figure type role. Furthermore, her secret quote on Tumblr reads, I want to pay for what I've done, but even then I still want to live, which could allude to a few things. Who has regrets about her life, but has grown to value her life to at least some degree, which could relate back to her quote about what it means to her to be useful. The only character I could see having the secret other than who is Terako because of her traumatic past, which is definitely alluded to in the secret with it calling the person a hopeless child. Child. However, I will stick with thinking this is Who's secret. Speaking of Terrico, I believe her secret is, how could I even select what secret to be your motive? Just about everything you've done is worth killing for. The killing game is your fault. This very ambiguous and ominous secret is definitely one that a protagonist would have, especially a protagonist like Terrico. Going back to what I was talking about with Terrico's confirmation bias,
this. If this secret is hers, it would just be the biggest stamp of approval for her confirmation bias that she makes everything worse. Also, since this is the secret David received, I think he lied about this being Xander's secret and asked to go last so he could use one of the dead people as a cover for revealing Terrico's secret. Now, why would David hide that Terrico is at fault for the killing game? Probably to mess with everyone and later reveal it when it benefits him the most. Plus, if this is Terrico's secret, this adds to the fact that Terrico and David are foils since their secrets are more about their ideologies than tangible actions of theirs. Terrico's Tumblr quote reads, it is an equal failing to trust everybody and to trust no one at all, which just more pertains to her trust no one mentality, but could allude to her traumatic past and contribute to the line, just about everything you've done is worth killing for. Lastly, hmm, actually, I'll wait for the next section to reveal my last prediction. I gotta keep you all on your toes. I mean, this is a mystery after all. Never mind. The last and probably the most important mystery of Despair Time currently is... Who killed Ara? And I have some suspicions, and I think the final secret has something to do with our culprit. I... I killed Ara. Despite his confession in episode 11, I don't think David killed Ara. It would be too obvious, and it would be quite interesting if the characters interacted with David knowing he's been manipulating them this whole time in future chapters. However, I do think David had some involvement in Ara's murder. I think David manipulated the killer by utilizing their secret and telling them that the only way for them to protect their secret is to commit a murder. He specifically chose Ara because of their confrontation in the relaxation room. I do think David was the one who overheard Ari and Eden's heartfelt moment in the infirmary and used it to make the culprit write the note to lure Ari to the playground. Now you're probably yelling at the screen, but Sam, who killed Ari? Well, I have two suspects. The less likely of my two suspects, but still very plausible, is that who killed Ari? Continuing on with my theory that David orchestrated Ari's murder but didn't do the actual killing, David views who as easily manipulatable. Also, who genuinely has the best interest of the entire group in mind? And David could have told her that if she went along with his plan, it would have benefited everyone. Furthermore, in chapter one, episode three, who had problems with Ari and who called out Ari for her fake crying and caused causing trouble for trouble's sake. David could have used Who's past issues with Ra along with Ra's secret to convince Who that Ra was a hindrance to the greater good of the group and that killing her was the only option. It is also highly possible that in chapter 2 episode 6 after Terrico leaves the relaxation room, David could have possibly convinced Who to tell him her secret, especially considering the icebreaker game he encouraged her to play with him could have been yet another manipulation tactic to get her to trust him more. If Who's secret is the one I think it is, David likely used Who's mentality about her usefulness to manipulate her into murdering without caring about herself, especially if David told her it was for the greater good of everyone. In addition, who was possibly involved in the fake out murder in chapter two where Nico tried to murder Ace, which just makes Who suspicious in general. Nico used a wire in their murder attempt, which was the weapon Who was given at the beginning of the killing game. It is a possibility that Who gave Nico her weapon so that they could kill Ace with her logic likely being the same with it being for the greater good since Ace was causing a lot of turmoil for everyone, especially Nico. Lastly, whose anger after David's reveal could be her realizing not only that she was defending a shitty person and was manipulated herself, but realizing now that she might die because she trusted David and the realization that this wasn't for the greater good. My second and more likely suspect for Ari's killer is Levi. Evidence of Levi being the chapter two killer goes all the way back to chapter one, episode three as well, where it is shown that Levi is quite gullible and could possibly possibly be easily manipulated. However, I don't think the fact that Levi is gullible is the main reason why Levi would kill Ra or why David chose Levi to execute his plan. It's finally time for the final secret. I believe Levi's secret is the one Ra received. You're a murderer and you have no remorse. In his bio, it reads, Levi seems to have a dangerous past that he's unwilling to talk about, suggesting that his past is something he regrets and that he has been trying to turn over a new leaf by being protective over everyone in the killing game. However, even with his desire to better himself, there's evidence of him having a more nefarious side, which I think is his killer's instinct. In chapter 1, episode 9, Levi loses his composure when Ace tells him to shut up, in which Levi then threatens to strangle him. Considering that Ace is such a major component of chapter 2, 
2 and Are also died by strangulation via hanging, Levi looks pretty suspicious and it would not surprise me if his comment about strangling Ace resurfaced in future parts of the chapter 2 trial. At the start of chapter 2, Levi says to Eden, I envy how easy it is for you to be kind, which eerily mirrors Are's dilemma especially with her feelings towards Eden. Later on in their conversation, Levi brings up how his family disowned him and continues on saying, there's no point in bringing up the past once it's out of my life. All that matters is what I do now. Even his secret quote on Tumblr alludes to his mysterious past actions saying, I always believed that a person is defined by their actions alone, but maybe that's just a poor excuse for my heartlessness. All of this points to Levi's secret being that he has murdered someone in the past, and while I think Levi has tried to turn his life around, he could still feel no remorse for the person he killed, whether that's because it was in self-defense or he was asked by someone he cared about to kill or any other reason. Similarly to my prediction for who, I think David one way or another found out Levi's secret from Are since Are received the murderer's secret. In her conversation with Eden in the infirmary, Are could have trusted Eden enough to tell her the secret she received, which creates some sad irony for Eden since before Are, Eden was comforting Levi because he was envious of her kindness. David could have overheard Are share the secret she received in their conversation, or he could have figured it out during any of his interactions with Are. I think David told Levi that Are had his secret and manipulated him into believing that Are was going to expose that he's a murderer to everyone and then prompted him to kill Are. Further evidence towards this theory is that Levi is the one who asked Mono TV how accomplices would work in a case since he would likely be the accomplice who executed David's plan. And when Wit says he knows exactly how to find Are's killer, Levi gets stressed out. He also doesn't have that good of an alibi in chapter 2 episode 10 as he could have easily lied about doing laundry since no one was there with him. After David's reveal, Levi is also the one to call for Mono TV to start voting, as everyone voting for David would mean he would win the killing game and escape. In addition, I think Levi being the chapter 2 killer would have an impact on the entire cast. I'm already planning on making an entire prediction video for this series, but I have a strong feeling that Ace is going to stay for a while. Either Ace is going to die in chapter 5 or he'll survive, and Levi's death might boost Ace to reevaluate how he's been treating everyone. Despite his past actions, Levi still cared about everyone's well-being and in Levi's final moments before being executed, I could see him apologizing to Ace for everything he said. Levi's apology would cause Ace to question his behavior and start taking better care of himself and everyone else. Of course, with his potty mouth and aggressive tendencies still thrown in there. Levi's death could also bring more despair to our protagonist Terako as Levi could have told David about the advice she gave him about abandoning any chance of having a friendship with Ace in chapter 2 episode 2 and David would not miss a chance of giving Terako more despair, especially considering my theory that David received Terako's secret. He would tell her that her advice failed Levi and blame her for both his and Are's deaths, giving into her confirmation bias that she just sends people to their graves by existing. Lastly, Danganronpa Despair Time has been taking past tropes from Danganronpa and subverting them. The false support character dying in chapter 1 like Sayaka, the secrets motive in chapter 2 like the first game, a big character reveal in chapter 2 like the reveal of Genocide Jack, Sparkling Justice, and Maki's true ultimate talent. Both Hu and Levi being the chapter 2 killer would add to a pre-existing trope. Who falls more into the categories of Pekko and Kurumi, with Who's downfall possibly being her allegiance to David like Pekko's allegiance to Fuyuhiko, and Who being the mother figure of the group like Kurumi. Also like Pekko and Kurumi, Who likely has an incredibly sad backstory that would serve as part of her motivation to kill. Levi would fit into the same trope as Mondo, the strong character with a dark secret who wishes to protect someone he's envious of. In Mondo's case, it was Chihiro, whom he ended up killing, and in Levi's case, it would be Eden. Overall, I could see either of them being the killer and each having their own impact on the story, but going back to the title and topic of this video, these two being the primary suspects continues to show the impact of David's reveal. He manipulated the cast into thinking that the only way to stop another murder was to expose their secrets, when in reality, all David wanted was just another murder to occur, in which he got what he wanted, and he will likely not be punished for his antics anytime soon. <laughs> Ha 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 ha!
The reveal of David being a manipulative liar has left a massive impact on the story of Danganronpa to spare time and will continue to affect the story. If you enjoyed Danganronpa to spare time, please continue to support the project and its creators as they all have put so much dedication, time, and work into the series and send your best wishes to the creator. Also, please respect the boundaries of everyone behind this series because I know the creator has had some issues with certain people taking advantage of the series and of their boundaries, so let's make sure to prevent any harm. If you liked this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to this channel, and turn on the bell for notification. Feel free to comment your theories, predictions, and thoughts about Dangarampa to spare time in the comments below, or if you're a fan of the series, who is your favorite character? I have a tendency to answer my own questions, so my favorite characters are Jay and Wit. I'll see you all in the next video. Thank you so much!